Hart. I'm the CEO of the Gresham Mary Chamber of Commerce, and thank you for joining us today for our Government Affairs Forum, our monthly forum. Uh, today's topic is what is healthcare ref what well, health care reforms means to you and your business, and I think um, everyone is still trying to figure that out. And so, thankfully, we have Tim Rash here, who's the Government Affairs Director of the Portland Association of Health Underwriters, to walk us through some of um, the intricacies of this. But as uh, uh, one of the conversations I was having before we started with Christy was that, you know, you got to go to a lot of different sources to understand because everyone has a little bit different idea about what this does mean to us. So hopefully we'll have some um, illumination by the end of today's session. Um, just a couple quick things. One is we do have another special program coming up this week. Um, Congressman Earl Blumenauer will be speaking on Thursday the 30th. Uh, we're doing a joint program with the East Metro Economic Alliance, and that will be a, a lunch forum as well, and that will be from 1130 to 1 at East Hill uh, Youth Center. I'd also like to thank our sponsors today. Our presenting sponsor is Riverview Community Bank, and you'll notice there's um, – cups on the table, and those are actually for you to take home with you if you'd like. They have generously donated those for our, or provided those for our presentation. We also have Gresham Barlow School District, who's one of our longtime sponsors of government affairs, and PGE, as well as Metro East Community Media. And we thank all of those partners for helping us put on the government affairs forum. I'd also like to recognize uh, Councillor Lori Stegman from the Gresham City Council, who's joined us today. And to thank our board leadership, we have a couple of board members here, Kirk French, Christy Brewster, um, and Audrey Wan, who is our chair of the Government Affairs Committee. And now I'm going to turn it over to him. Thank you, Andre. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Well, living in Oregon, we live in a very interesting laboratory as far as uh, health care reform goes. And uh, not only do we have the Affordable Care Act on the federal level, but we also have sweeping state health care reform, or uh, as some call it, kids over care. Um, and so today we uh, will have an expert break it all down for us. Tim Rash is a senior benefits broker at Larry Sherwood and Associates, specializing in business and commercial plans. Tim has served in a legislative capacity for the Port Health, Portland Health Underwriters Association for almost five years and has now served on the board of <clears throat> the Portland Human Resources Management uh, for one year. He is also the incoming president-elect for the Portland Association of Health Underwriters. Tim has testified before the Oregon Health Authority and the Oregon Health Fund Board on how health care reform is going to impact his clients. Tim has also <clears throat> uh, met with uh, legislators from all co uh, corners of Oregon to help define going forward how the Affordable Care Act is going to change the life of Oregonians and how they will purchase health insurance. Uh, in his spare time, Tim and his family enjoy uh, exploring hiking trails in Portland, camping on the coast, and Tim is always looking to improve his golf swing, but apparently not today. Uh, he is a renowned speaker and expert on the practical effects of health care reform. We will please welcome Tim Rash. Thank you, Andre. Yeah, in fact, uh, this past weekend, hope everybody enjoyed a nice long weekend. My wife and I celebrated our 17th wedding anniversary by doing exactly nothing, and it was fantastic. So. Um, but yes, I have had the chance to explore the many corners and crevices that this beautiful golf course has to offer. And when you golf with me, you get lots of exercise. So um, we'll just leave it at that. So, but yes, Andre, thank you so much for the introduction. And um, I guess we'll just kind of dive right into this. And uh, I've got a few pictures and some scenery from, uh, from Oregon. And uh, there's a picture of Crater Lake that we found in the quote that the ACA is now the law of the land. And basically that kind of became the premise within our industry of health association folks when the Supreme Court took a crack at it and decided that the Affordable Care Act does pass the smell test, can be a, a, a viable law in the U.S. based on how they are assessing these penalties as a tax. So we'll spend a little bit of time diving into that. I know we have about 45 minutes today, half hour, 45 minutes. So um, the good news is this is about an eight-hour session all in itself. So we're going to fly through these with about five seconds a slide. But um, I, what I tried to do is, is pick some things that, that would, uh, to a wide group of business leaders, kind of, why do I need to worry about this? Why is this important to me? Not only as an Oregonian, but possibly as a business leader, as a small employer, as a large employer. So I've, I've kind of got a mix of, of what's going to go on within our agenda today. 
And, um, but please, uh, feel free to stop me, ask a question, go through this, make this very interactive. That's some of the agenda items that we'll, we'll cover today. Uh, I want to start kind of how we got here, some of the trends in the marketplace. Why, why is this such a key issue? Why are we spending so much? Why is this so important? Um, and kind of going back to why we offer benefits to our employees in the first place. So we'll talk about some mandates. We're going to determine your size. Are you a small employer or a large employer? We'll kind of talk about what's going on in 2013. We're going to talk a little bit about kind of how to measure, administrate, and stabilize your benefit plan. If you do have variable hour employees, that's kind of a, a meat and potatoes component of the Affordable Care Act for employees who might just barely miss out on being offered insurance. For the small business owners in the room, we'll talk a little bit about the tax credit, some mandates for next year, and then kind of some keys and some safe harbors on, on just kind of ways that I don't want to know a lot about it. I just kind of want to know enough as a business owner on, on kind of how to get around what's all important. So I want to talk a little bit about the HR component at our, at our businesses. The, you know, wh why do we do this? Why did we get to this point where, where the health insurance, the benefit discussion is so key? And it, it just kind of goes back to what we get as employees for working at our employers, what we offer ourselves, what we offer our people, and, and kind of some of the biggest challenges over the next 10 years that HR people are focused with as we're trying to grow the next generation of entrepreneurs, of leaders, of, of employees. It, it costs so much to replace employees, so is there a way that we could keep them from walking out the door? And or could we create an environment, could we create a culture at our office so that we can steal the top employee from down the street? And so that's kind of where a lot of this investment challenges, talent management tactics, we want to involve the workforce. There's discussions about can you work from home, can you not work from home? Do employees think that that's a benefit as well? So um, I just wanted to spend a couple slides talking about some of the challenges that we have in the workforce before we even kind of consider how the Affordable Care Act is going to impact our businesses. And this slide here to me is real important because in the lower right-hand corner you've got the 79% of the insurance that's offered to employees is PPO based. That's where the employer has a wide base of providers, hospitals, go anywhere you want, and we're gonna try to we're gonna try to make it as simple and easy as you, the employee, on when it comes time to access care. In the middle, we have consumer-driven health plans at 58%, and that slide is rapidly growing. About probably three, four years ago, that consumer-driven health plan slide would have flip-flopped on the right-hand side where you see HMO, Health Maintenance Organization, and I'll talk about that for a minute. Because consumer-driven health plans are these higher deductibles that we as employers are electing to purchase because there's one thing that we want to control in this discussion, and that's what we pay. And so if I can do the dance and choose a higher deductible for my employees, maybe in a health care savings arrangement or a health care uh, reimbursement arrangement, depending on if I'm going to offset some of the deductible costs, the one thing I know that I can control as a business owner is what I pay my insurance company. That's it. I don't know if my employees are going to use it. I don't know if the, my employees are going to incorporate large out-of-pocket costs. But this is an area that we've seen a lot of growth because we've been able to mitigate what the employer pays and then incorporate some education and some marketing tools to the employee on what happens when you do go to, to the emergency room versus urgent care. If you do have a deductible expense versus an inpatient procedure versus an outpatient procedure kind of a thing. And we're actually seeing a lot of success in consumerism on us as educated health insurance purchasers on making decisions for our health care. If something's going to cost me a lot of money out of pocket going to Providence, but I can get it done better at a lower rate at Kaiser, and if it's just an x-ray, why don't I just go to Kaiser and pay a copay and get it done kind of a thing. So we're actually seeing a lot of success in consumerism, and we're seeing a lot of, of, of growth in that consumer-driven health plan but now we have to introduce, and we talk about shifting gears, uh-oh, here's where the affordable, the affordable Care Act comes into place, because the White House talks about health insurance affordability as if the member insures a claim or incurs a claim, can the member pay for their insurance costs? So if I have that high deductible at my workforce and my employee incurs a claim, can they afford their deductible? Not just the premium that we're paying or they're paying, but the actual health care cost. So we have some concerns in our industry about 
is the consumerism component going to be kind of forced out the window because the Affordable Care Act wants to kind of steer states, steer the federal government into what deductibles can and cannot be offered. So there's a little bit of concern as we're starting to have some success without the Affordable Care Act. Now we're kind of being told what we can and cannot sell, what we can and cannot uh, offer. So I'm gonna, that's kind of be kind of our overall theme through some of this as well, is making sure that, that as insurance carriers are tightening up their PPO markets, making it smaller, maybe that's eliminating some of the access that we're allowed to have, fewer providers, fewer hospitals in our panel. When we look at our ID card and it shows us where we can go to get our access to care, shows us what our co-pays are, what some of the insurance carriers are doing to offset that, is I'm gonna take this massive PPO network that had all the hospitals in Portland and we're gonna start kicking people out. And we're gonna to try to make this more managed because the insurance companies are trying to manage just the better cost control for what clinic A charges for procedures versus what clinic B charges for procedures. Because we as the end user, we end up paying for that ourselves. So, and then on the last bullet, I talk about dance partners are starting to line up because the insurance carriers here in Oregon that aren't tied to hospitals are starting to realign themselves with those that have either smaller networks or make it more lucrative for them to sign up. For example, if we have anybody here in the room that has a HealthNet ID card within the past year, you probably got notice saying that you were losing Providence providers to get access to care done. And that was kind of where Providence pulled the rug out because they decided that it wasn't lucrative for them to work with HealthNet. And so HealthNet had to scramble with all their members, all their groups on moving them to different PPO markets because we're starting to kind of see this shift in the marketplace where carriers, insurance carriers and hospital systems are trying to find the best way to deal with some of the, the cost control that Affordable Care Act is putting in. So enough of the behind the scenes stuff. Let's just kind of talk about this, this some people want to call it a penalty, some people want to call it a tax. Let's kind of jump into what kind of opens our eyes on, wait a minute, I have to pay a fine if I'm an employer and I do or I do not offer insurance to my people. So let's just kind of hit this with the ground running. And the biggest thing I want to kind of stress is for those of you that are under 50 employees, that's everybody, that's full-time, part-time, if you're paying less than 50 people, a lot of this you're exposed from, and we're going to talk about it here in a minute on how do I determine am I a large employer or a small employer here in Oregon. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But let's just kind of get this out of the way because a lot of people seem to be so concerned that, hey, if I don't offer insurance to my employees, I'm going to have a $2,000 fine is the second bullet stands for. Or if I currently offer insurance to only my managers but not to my frontline staff or my hourly wage employees or my part-time employees, Am I going to be? A, am I going to hit a, a get a fine if that employee goes to the exchange and receives a subsidy? So right now, the biggest concern for everybody in the room, we can all just kind of take a load off our minds, is just kind of think of yourself. If you work for an employer that has less than 50 employees, a lot of these fines, taxes, penalties will not matter to you. Period. You'll be able to continue on and, and continue on the insurance plan that you have, and we kind of talk about some of the tax credits here in a minute. But one of the things that we're trying to avoid is the large employer who wants to become a small employer. And there's some terms you're going to start, if you follow the Wall Street Journal or if you follow the New York Times or if you follow any Bloomberg articles on kind of how this is now kind of the, the topic du jour going across the country is you're going to start seeing these terms called 49ers and 29ers. And no, it's not the San Francisco 49ers. What we're looking at is employers who are trying to shave off their employee count. So if they are at 100 employees or 75 employees, they've done the math, and I'll show you here in a minute how we can do the math, because they want to alleviate some of this exposure. And right now the IRS is watching that like a hawk because 2013 is when you have to set your benchmark on going forward. So if you want to alleviate yourself from some exposures, from any concerns that the, uh, the, the, the ACA has for you, 2013 is where you set your benchmark. So if you want to alleviate exposure on employees who currently work over 30 hours that you'll have to offer insurance to in 2014, this is a year where you have to sit down with them, have the conversation and say, you're no longer a full-time employee, I'm moving you to part-time status, effective 2013. You have to make these changes now. Because 
if and when you're ever audited in 2014 or 2015 or 2016 by the time they get to your company, they're going to want to take a look at, at the date and time when we put the staff in the sand and we said, what's your employee count? And that's 2013. So right now you're seeing a lot of articles published. You're seeing a lot of stuff on the Internet about how to do it, how not to do it, maybe why you shouldn't do it. Um, but if you have a concern and you're at or above 50 employees or you know people who are that are kind of having this discussion, we can talk offline because there's a lot of things that we want to make sure that we build in a safe harbor format to keep you from looking like a red beacon to the IRS as they're now looking for companies that are splitting up ownership groups, splitting out employees out, dropping them below 30 hours, everything they, do, they can do to kind of weave their way around it. So um, that's a big area of concern. So let's talk about what are we? Are we a big employer or a big employee? I mean, in um, first step A, how many full-time employees you have? Write that number down. Then underneath that, take an average total hours worked by your part-timers and add that up underneath. So take it off your payroll. Sometimes what I'm trying to do is with folks is let's take a, let's take a three month, a 90 day, that might be six payrolls. Let's add up what those hours are, divide it by 130, divide it back by three months. And what that's gonna do is that's gonna give us our full-time equivalents that we need to add to our full-time employees at A plus C, and that's your full-time equivalent exposure to the Affordable Care Act. So some companies are right on the bubble, so they're taking a 12-month look. Some people know they might be at 60 or 65. Let's just take the month of March as an example. Wasn't a big, huge month for maybe it's a winter spike or a summer spike. We didn't have a lot of seasonal employees. Would be an easy month to divide. And let's figure out what this number is because this goes back to the previous slide. Are we above 50 or are we below 50? Do we offer insurance to all of our employees? And then one of the other components that we have to work into it now is, is the insurance offered? Is it offered to 95% of our employee base? And is it based affordable? So this is kind of just a, a simple way to do the math on what are we, if we're above it, if we're below it. Then it kind of steers you into, um, if I'm below it, one of the things that I qualify for is a small employer tax credit. So now you figured out that you might be 20 full-time equivalent employees, what's my average annual wage, does my employer contribute at least 50% to a health care cost, um, you know, am I 10 employees, 15 employees, or 20 employees, because there's a wide variety. I wrote that health care law guide on top, bullet number one, because I, I do not play a CPA, nor do I want to be a CPA. Uh, I'd love to tell you to find a good CPA. Hopefully there's a good CPA in the room. And this is where you can kind of decide, is it worth the exercise of going down this calculation or not? And my, my suggestion to small businesses is take advantage of it. One of the things about the Affordable Care Act is it offers this benefit to small employers. There aren't really a whole lot of benefits to the Affordable Care Act to small employers outside of this. So I would definitely say keep this on your horizon. Start doing the math this year because you'll know next year if you want to continue down that path what you qualify for. But again, this, this will work if you did the math on the previous screen, discovered that you're smaller, you have less than 50 employees. Um, in fact, in this case, you have to be less than 25 full-time equivalents, but take a look at it. If, if, you're, if your average salaries are down, and again, you don't include owners, you don't include partners, you don't include family members that might be part of it, this is just an average wage of your workforce. Questions, thoughts on that? The um, mandates for 2013, this is kind of some of the stuff that, that we need to be involved with this year. Um, it really doesn't have any too large of an impact on the current benefit plans that we offer. Um, but again, this is whether you're a small employer or a large employer. These are some things that are coming out. First off, as you renew your benefit plans this year, you're going to get these really nice, elaborate summary of benefits of coverage called an SBC. And it's nice. I've got to hand it to the Affordable Care Act. It's, it's one of the, it, it, it's kind of a, a pain in the lower backside for the insurance carriers because they have to change the, the marketing literature that they send out to their clients. But as a insured, it's nice to get because it really explains the insurance plan that I've chosen through my employer a lot nicer. So it, I think that's a good thing. But you will, you will definitely see a change in the look and feel of the benefit summaries that you hand out to your employees as you, as you renew your benefits. Um, for those larger employers or if you have a lot of temp employees or if you have a lot of turnover in a certain part of your division 
and you file more than 250 W-2s, you will need to report those electronically, but those of you that are, in most cases, a lot of people are doing that already, but that's one change for a lot of folks this year. The flexible spending account maximum of $2,500. Here's where the IRS, in its infinite wisdom, discovered that they were allowing employers to offer as, as high a maximum as they wanted to go through their employees to set money aside pre-tax. And they discovered that across the board from East Coast to West Coast, a lot of companies were taking advantage of this. A lot of employees at those companies were taking advantage of it. And there was a lot of FICA and FUTA money that was going uncollected. So the IRS said, forget it. We're going to set a limit. And if you want to have money set aside pre-tax for out-of-pocket out, out of medical expenses, co-pays, uh, anything that was medically necessary to a doctor, to a dentist, um, to anything that might be prescription drug that's uh, prescribed to you. Uh, there's a lot of things on your list that you can use this for. Um, this excludes daycare. This is not part of any daycare money you have set aside. But they basically set a maximum that you could set aside in a, in a calendar year because they're trying to increase that tax money back to the IRS because we start need to pay and fund some of this health care expenses. So that's one of the reasons why they just put a line in the sand and said as of 2013, no employees can have withheld greater than $2,500. So it may seem kind of like a ho-hum deal, but it's in our industry and kind of looking at the fine print, we're starting to see these things where the IRS is waking up going, wait a minute, there's money to be made here and we want to make sure that we can get back as much as we can because they are basically the collector of all these taxes, fines, penalties for the ACA. Um, this summer, actually, in fact, I just got a release sent to me last week. Those uh, of you in the room here, um, small business or large business, doesn't matter. We're going to have to start getting notices out to our employees what these exchanges and subsidies are. Um, and I don't, I don't have a lot of information or slides on the exchanges. Maybe at the end we, I can kind of give you a quick overview as to how the Oregon exchange is going to work. It's extremely exciting and, and how the subsidies work. But note, the, um, the notices are actually now just kind of being printed, put together. We're hoping we can do a lot of it electronically. But your broker and or the insurance carrier should be sending this out to you and you'll have two versions. One that you need to send out to your employees if you do currently offer insurance and another if you don't. Because basically, if you do currently offer insurance, you'll need to fill out on this form who your insurance carrier is, what do you provide, all this kind of stuff, what's the uh, responsibility of your employees, all that kind of stuff. So you'll be seeing those coming out. Again, this is for those of you that currently offer a benefit plan and or don't. We need to start getting the information out to our employees as to what's coming down the pike for open enrollment come October. Um, as, I'll, as I just mentioned there for October 1st. Basically, you're going to have um, three months, and I think if it mirrors the, the Medicare date of, I think it's December 12th or December 15th, when open enrollment will close for January 1st. But the exchange will be open for business, and you're going to see some enrollment uh, opportunities, uh, some new enrollment things that we haven't ever had to do in the past here in Oregon, because that's going to be a new way for, or, or another avenue for small businesses and individuals to um, purchase insurance. So now that you've decided your, um, let's, let's take a leap of faith here going forward and let's just say that we've discovered that we're a large employer and we're over that 50 uh, employee threshold and we've got some employees who are around this 30 hour threshold where the Affordable Care Act says I now have to offer insurance to if they work over 30 hours. But maybe they average 30 hours, maybe they don't. And so do I have to offer insurance to those people that we're basically now going to give the title to as a variable hour employee? How do we handle that block of employees? And basically the Affordable Care Act in its infinite wisdom created these three categories, measurement period, administrative period, and stability period. And basically what it's doing is it's giving you, the employer, the option to figure out how do you want to measure this block of variable hour employees. You want to go three months? You want to go six months? You want to go 12 months? The risk is if an employee, if I average out at 30.2 hours at your office, then you have to provide insurance for me the exact same amount of time that you measured me. So if it was 90 days, you have to provide insurance for 90 days. If it was six months and so forth. And you've got a couple months there to enroll me in the plan. The, the, the law states 
that if you have an employee that averages over 30 hours, they have to be on your insurance plan by the 13th month. So basically that's why you can't exceed 12 months because then you get a month to enroll me and then by, by that 13th month now I'm on your insurance plan. And I get to stay there for a year if you measured me for 12 months. So the issue is if you're a large employer, how do you want to handle this? What's the best way to do it? Because it's, I don't want to use the word nightmare, but it's going to be a concern. If you have a lot of employees that are in this realm, you're going to have to show your measurement because it's part of your full-time equivalent calculator. And if you're audited and you don't offer those employees insurance, you have to show them what you're doing. And so this is where if you outsource your payroll or if you have an in-house payroll system, let me know. And there's some spreadsheets that some of us are starting to build, and I'll show you one here in a minute, on how there's an easy way to track this. But this is very important because you can't let someone slip through the cracks. Because if they do, chances are you might get hit with a subsidy from the exchange, and or that might be an open door for an auditor to come in and say, hey, we got one employee. Are there more? we got to pay for this, and we're hoping you can help us pay for it. So you're going to start reading and seeing some more information on, on, on these three terms. And I, if you are a large employer, I think it's very valuable, very important to pay attention or catch me afterwards or we can spend hours talking about this if you really want to. But the, the, the key is in the measurement component, the data that you're tracking from your payroll, how you're storing it, how you're tracking it, how you're averaging it. It's very important because we don't. We don't want employees to slip through the crack and then end up going to the exchange and or walking into your office four months later, they want to file a liability insurance claim because they had something bad happen at home and you never offered them insurance. So there's a lot that we need to do. And the repeat is kind of the only word I could come up with because it's going to go on, as far as we know, forever. We're always going to have to be measuring and offering insurance to these people that average over, over 30 hours. So it goes back to kind of how we started our conversation. Do I have a group of employees that works over 30 hours that I don't want to offer insurance to? So am I going to cut their hours back and be a 29er, and then are those the employees I'm going to have to spend a lot of time measuring, or should I just say, forget it. It's going to take a lot of resources, time, and effort. If you average 32 hours insurance working today, I'm going to give you insurance. So um, this is you're going to start seeing and reading a lot more on this, and, and we as brokers and attorneys, we're going to start learning a lot more about this too, but, but this is going to be very key um, for employers that, again, average over 50 uh, full-time equivalent employees. Look like it. Oh, question. Okay. So here's my, here's, the Rash family spends a weekend at the coast, and this is what my daughter's dad, me, spends a lot of time thinking about because I'm trying to come up with a way to make this as easy and simple as possible for my clients because right now, for those of you that offer insurance, you get a 12 month contract from your carrier. You have the same open enrollment month because you have the same effective month that you've had forever. If you offer benefits July 1st, June is your month to make changes. Your contract ends June 31st. You either have your broker or you, you're working direct with the carrier and you've got your renewal rates effective July 1st and you roll forward. But see, now things are about to change. And so what I tried to do is I tried to come up with a way that could we perform the same duties during the same times of the year just to help us kind of put heads or tails of it. So what I did is I chose a six-month um, measurement period. And as you notice, in the yellow, you're constantly going to be measuring your employees that do not fall within the 30-hour above insurance because you'll never, that group you might never enroll. But what I tried to do is come up with a way, and you can think of this as my little gift to you if you have a hard time, you know, falling asleep at night as I do. November, December, and um, was it... May and June will be your open enrollment months. Your effective dates will always be January 1st and July 1st, and you can just kind of roll through with your current existing employees, and for those that you, you mark back to 30 hours or 29 hours and below, or maybe you hire part-time employees at your workforce, this is a simple way, and I think it's in the, um, I emailed it so we can go ahead and get it out on the website, or we can go ahead and get copies emailed out to people. But it's, it's an easy way to just try to think about what am I going to do going forward. If this issue um, involves us at our company, how can I try to make it simple? So what I haven't done is I haven't gone back and tested the three-month or the 12-month. I believe the 12-month may be very similar. But it's just kind of a way to start to say, well, why are all these important? Because you just have to make sure that you don't undercut someone's insurance or overpay somebody. Because if you have a handful of people in your stability period, 
and you cancel one person's insurance, but you should have canceled some others with it, you know, there could be some employee employer ramifications. So it's just kind of a, a, a of an easy way to, to try to think about how do we do this for our going forward employees on keeping ourselves out of hot water with the Department of Labor or um, or the IRS. Any thoughts or questions on that? You like the colors I chose. Thank you, Tim. Uh, as an insurance agent, uh, there's something called employee benefits insurance on commercial policies, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking <laughs> yeah. there's going to be a huge yeah. increase because of that coverage. So if you employ, if you have employees, I mean, it's one thing if you maybe you forget to add somebody to your health insurance or you forget to put them on the 401k. Now it just becomes a nightmare. Yes. So that's just uh, 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 some advice is talk to your insurance agent about do I have coverage so that if I make a mistake, I forget to add somebody when I should have, right. do I have coverage? And I'm not sure how that coverage is going to change or if it will change in light of the of the uh, Affordable Health Care Act. I don't know, maybe do you, have you heard anything from that end? You know, I, I haven't, and that's a real good question because I, I mentioned earlier about how we normally have one open enrollment period a year at our employers, at our groups, at our, for ourselves. Well, in this example here, I'm going to have two, and I'm going to have two every year going forward. So now we're doubling the opportunity to miss something. So that's a very good question on double checking your commercial liability policy, making sure, if, and a lot of them I think are standard $100,000 limits kind of a deal that I've seen. That might just be a question to check with your agent on, you know, what's it cost if we double this? Because what happens if you miss somebody, they end up in an emergency room, which then gets admitted to the hospital, which then admits to an inpatient surgical procedure, which could quickly amount to a $7,500,000 bill. I mean, I see them all the time. So that might be a situation where, hey, let's just double check, make sure our ducks in a row, because we do have added enrollment opportunities during the year versus we didn't before. So good question. So now let's kind of jump ahead a year to 2014, and let's just kind of recap a little bit as, as to what's going to go on with the Affordable Care Act and some things I just need to make sure. Now, the, the, the Care Act itself doesn't state that the employers have to pay insurance. You don't. We kind of we showed this slide earlier. If you're a large employer on $2,000 or $3,000, depending on if you offer insurance or not. But basically what this does is this now, sh this now throws the insurance to me, the, the employee, the member. And I, and I handed out some slides on the tables. It's from the Kaiser Family Foundation kind of looks like this. And this is something, if you want, I can send, I can email you the link if you wanted to send this out to your employees, if you wanted to keep it around the office. Just kind of basic, basically kind of starts, do I need to have insurance? Um, and, you know, and or as an employer, do I need to offer insurance to keep myself out of hot water? So Kaiser Family Foundation has a ton of, of information, whether you're a Kaiser member or not. I believe the website's kff.org. It's a great place to go for resources, information. I go there just about every day. That's how much fun my life is. And um, I just, it, as you have questions or as people bring up questions or, or things that you might be thinking about, is this for me as, a, as an insured Oregonian? Are there some things I need to worry about? It's a, it's a, it's a great place to go. Um, one of the things that we're going to talk about, you're going to hear, is essential health benefits. With the exchanges comes these metal rounds you're going to start hearing, bronze, silver, gold, where our state is going to have to start setting deductibles, co-pays, co-insurance, based on a metal tier, based on your income level, based on what you can afford. Subsidies are then coming, coming off of that. So we, we drew the line in the sand. We have our essential health benefit for Oregon chosen. Right now, depends on who you talk to, depends on the day of the week, the time of the day that you talk to them, what those deductibles are going to be. Right now, um, uh, in conversation I had with uh, Cover Oregon, who was running our Oregonian exchange, the bronze level, the kind of the baseline that we're looking at, we, we're thinking the bronze level deductible is going to be in the $5,000 range. But it depends on who you talk to. It could be 5400 could be for Regents wants it at $4,600. So who, who knows? It's going to fall somewhere within that $5,400 to $4,600 range. And then what you'll see is a stair-step method going forward. Silver plan could be in the $2,500 range. The gold plan could be somewhere in the $1,000 range. And those are all kind of sort of being decided as we speak. So you'll start to see a lot more about that. The, the elephant in the room that's going to be driving a lot of costs, whether you are enrolled as an individual or as a small employer or a large employer, is the pre-existing condition clause is gone. 
as of January 1st. And what that means is that's a lot of added exposure to the insurance companies because they cannot underwrite you if you are a 54-year-old single male that is type 2 diabetic or a 32-year-old single mom who is suffering from breast cancer. They cannot rate your insurance policy based on the health condition that you are currently enjoying. And so basically what that's going to do is the insurance companies right now are filing their rates for 2014 with the insurance commissioner here in Oregon. And we're having a lot of fun, exciting, enlightening debates on what they think the rates should be for small employers and individuals starting January 1st. So you're going to start reading some things in the Oregonian because that newspaper loves to publish the good news of the Affordable Care Act and what that's going to cost us. And all I ask you to do is just kind of take it as a grain of salt and just kind of store it in the back of your mind and don't think that it's the gospel as to how things are going to go. That's my editorial comment because right now the insurance carriers know that they have to come in with a high rate to get any rate approved because there's a rate review here in Oregon. If, if you, the insurance company, wants to file a rate, and I think it's greater than 7, you know, 7 or 11%, it goes for rate review, and you have to sit down in front of a panel, including the insurance commissioner, and justify your rate increases from year over year. And what we don't know is the insurance carriers don't know how many people are going to enroll that don't currently have insurance because they're currently suffering from a health condition. And starting January 1st, they'll be able to have health insurance coverage and file a claim on day number two. So that's what we don't really know and that's some of the things that you're going to start to see and read a lot more about this fall is insurance companies that are going to be made to kind of look in a negative light because they have to cover their bases. And, and those of us that are insured, we kind of want that because we're all, that's also going to impact us too if you're in the plan, if you're, if you're covered with insurance. You know, it's chances are, no matter where you're at here in Oregon, big, small, individual, your rates are going to climb. The matter is, can we control how much it's going to climb? So um, we probably won't know that for sure until the end of September, the first part of October, what those rates are going to look like. But it's a big discussion behind the scenes as to not just what can we offer Oregonians, what are the subsidies going to be, the fact that the money is coming from the federal government, um, is great because it's, it's less tax burden for us here. But it's, it, it, it's going to be a big deal because I think we're going to be shocked more than pleased as to what these increases are going to be. I mentioned earlier about the hourly requirement. If you do work for an employer uh, in excess of 50 employees, uh, you must be offered insurance if you work over 30 hours. And we're also seeing this, this wellness incentive that's kind of still sort of being figured out better. And it's, we're calling it wellness because we don't want to attack the smokers. But basically, it's a, it's, a, it's a glorified smoker cessation program where you can actually de-incentivize your employees who smoke and encourage them, one of these deals, encourage them to pay more on their health insurance plan because you as an employer want to help them quit smoking. So there's going to be some further clarification on what you can and cannot do as an employer to your employees who smoke because there are ramifications in the Affordable Care Act where you can reward your non-smokers. So you'll start to see more about that. And that's new to Oregon. And that's, a little, that's going to be a little out there for us in this state. And so it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. But we've had some discussions already with the folks back in Washington, D.C. on kind of what are some ways that we could roll this out here in, in our very liberal state. Because we, we don't necessarily want to make people feel like they're being penalized. We want to reward folks for the healthy lifestyle and consequences that they make. So... How that's going to be, what that's going to turn out, but there are going to be some options for it here coming up shortly. And then a little funny editorial comment I found on that. So, um, so as we kind of start to wrap this up, and I want to leave lots of time for questions because it's hard, kind of hard in a room full of people is to kind of pinpoint everybody. We're all coming from a different swath of cloth. So I, I wanted to just kind of um, kind of recap as a business owner, as you're worried about this, have some concerns as to what we're doing. Is this is just kind of the first thing is let's let's figure out our number. Let's go through Tim's math and figure out are we large or are we small? Or people that talk to us, if, if people rely on us for service or support, are you a large or are you a small employer? And let's start there. Second, let's find out what our average wage salary is if we are a small employer. Kick out the owners, kick out the partners, kick out anybody that's part of a family ownership group, and let's find out what our average wage salary is. Is the current insurance plan that we offer affordable? I underline that because affordable to the Affordable Care Act means 9.5% 
of your box one of your W-2. It's not your household income. It's not if you're um, renting out a room in your house and you've got someone paying you rent. It's how much is your employer paying you, the employee, because if they're asking you to pay more than 9.5% of your gross take-home pay on a monthly basis, you could raise your hand to the exchange and say, hey, my employers making me pay insurance that could not could possibly be deemed unaffordable so let's look at what you're currently doing what's your deductibles what's your co-pays what are you uh, what are you asking them to pay are you providing all of the insurance on hundred percent as an employer but we're concerned about increased costs the next couple of years so do I offer do I change it so my employees now have to pay a piece of it there's a lot going on in the industry right now where employers are taking a look at you know, hey, I can't continue to operate the way we're operating it. We're going to have to either increase deductibles, ask you to pay us some, maybe reduce what we pay for your dependents, all kinds of stuff going on. Do we offer that plan to 95% of our employees? Do at least 75% of those participate? See, you didn't know there was going to be a math test today, did you? And then do we also cover at least 50% of the employee-only premium? One of the nice things about Oregon is we've been ahead of that curve forever. In order to offer an employer-sponsored insurance plan, you've got to pay at least half. But I threw that up there because not all the states in the country do that. So that's at least a good thing to us here in Oregon. Do we offer different insurance to different employees? Do I have management that gets one set? Do I have employees that get another set? Do I have these other employees that I don't really appreciate, but I have to have them and I don't want to offer them insurance in the first place? So that's another area that I'm sure we as agents are very busy trying to make sure, are we adding or increasing possible discrimination? Are we adding possible increased people going to the exchange because Andre got better insurance than I did and I want someone to know about it. So that's another thing that we need to take into consideration is making sure that we are not being discriminatory as an employer, yet we want to continue operating how we've always operated. And this is how I choose to compensate my employees. That's how we choose. And then my final 49er and 29er component is just be aware. Just be, our, our, what are you trying to be strategic with this? Because I get it. As a business owner, this is, this is going to change how, uh, for example, some of my clients in the restaurant industry are looking at setting up their restaurants going forward. I've got some clients who are looking at shutting down locations. I've got clients that are looking at possibly having to increase the cost of the food that they serve their customers. I mean, this could be a big deal to, to uh, employers. A uh, discussion I got involved with last week was to a large manufacturer who competes with smaller manufacturers who deliberately keep their workforce less than 50 employees because they don't have to factor in health insurance costs in their RFPs. And yet, the business owner that I was talking to, you can't necessarily drop below. You'd be a red beacon of light on the horizon to the IRS. And is that really the best way that you want to show how you want to compete in the marketplace is by dropping two-thirds of your workforce? So this is, this is key because this, a lot of these components here are going to impact a lot of businesses. And, and hopefully, as a chamber, hopefully, as a group of business owners, we can kind of work together and say, well, what are the strengths behind it? And some of the things that I, that I counter with it is, do you want to be an employer of choice? Do you want to be an employer that's able to retain? Go back to the very first slide. Why are we doing this in the first place? Because we found that it's extremely expensive and time consuming to replace key employees. So do we want to be an employer that competes in today's marketplace, or do we want to look like one that's kind of running to the fences? So there's some definite strengths and advantages to the ACA, and hopefully partnering with, with Andre or partnering with the Chamber, or I'm, I'll pass it on my business card, and feel free to um, keep me involved, keep me in the loop. And I'd, I'd love to find out what people are hearing and saying, reading. I get about 10 to 15 emails a day of people that send me the same Wall Street Journal link. I think it's awesome because it shows that we're out there trying to research and find out what's, what's going on in the marketplace. So we had a short amount of time today, um, and I wanted to leave a lot of time open for questions on kind of what impacts you. There's a lot of things that we didn't talk about. We didn't talk about the Cadillac tax. We didn't talk about in 2016. A lot of this stuff that's 50 and greater is going to be now 100 and greater. So what's that going to mean if I have to pay today? Am I going to have to pay tomorrow? We don't know. Um, are you going to start reading a lot more on private exchanges? Could these be co-ops? Could these be pools of employers in the same industry or associations pooling together to kind of build their own exchange better for pricing arrangements? Um, 
one of the other information that's on that uh, the Kaiser Family Forum is, you know, taxes, fees, penalties. I just got a slide this morning from another insurance carrier that thinks coming out of the out of the box, there's going to be at least an eight to twelve percent fee increase that the insurance carriers are being required to attach to their insurance plans in 2014, well, you know that 8 to 12 percent is just going to come right back to us. And that doesn't even factor in trend or the normal increases that insurance costs have. So if you got an 8 percent increase this year, does it mean you're automatically going to get a 16 to 20 percent increase next year? We don't know. Um, seasonal employees. We didn't really spend too much time. I've got hours and hours and days of fun information on that. So if you have a hard time falling asleep at night, let me know. Basically, the, um, the gist of that is 120 days. Are you on an annual basis hiring a winter crew, summer crew, Christmas retail? If you can show, if you've got a safe harbor of this is my standard MO year over year, I bring in this group for the summer, I bring in this group, we're a, we're a golf resort, we do a ton of uh, golf tournaments, and I bring in this kind of group from, from May to October. Oh, wait a minute, that's five months. Are you outside the scope? You're going to have to offer those people insurance. Right now, what we're coaching folks is that if you can show that that's been your MO and that's how you operate your business, that may be a safe harbor for you. Worst case scenario, you may have to put employees on your insurance plan for a month. So those are kind of two ways down the road that we're looking at it for seasonal employees. And what if I have employees in another state? Guess what? You, get, you have to know as an employer what that state's exchange is doing. Is that an individual exchange like Oregon is? Or is it, could it be like Montana? Could it be like a bunch of others in the center of the state that are going to say, forget this, I want the feds to run it? So if you have employees outside of Oregon's borders, it's up to you to know what those exchanges are going to be. The good news is you now have me in your back pocket, and I'll do that fun, exciting work for you. So, um, But that's, that's basically what I brought. It was about 30 minutes. I want to leave some time for questions. So um, there's, there's a lot that we didn't go through. And if you had any th specifics, um, let me know. It was great to be here today. Uh, please identify your name and business. Thank you. Uh, Sharon Garner, Bricks for Kids. I <clears throat> just want to hop back to seasonal uh, employees because I do have seasonal employees. Uh, what if you don't have a long track record that you can base the uh, hiring in the wintertime, five months, six months, hiring in the summertime, that kind of thing, if you've only got a two-year track record before we have to start doing those calculations? I think you'd be fine because the, the goal is to show the IRS that in 2014, we didn't change how we operate our business drastically from how we operated it in 2013. So my coaching to companies right now that are on that 49 or 29er bubble, you got to do it now. You got to make it look like you're making your business decision in 2013, and this is how we're going to go forward. So, companies that are surprised in 2014 or 2015 who didn't take that opportunity now to say, hey, maybe we could bring these people on a seasonal, or maybe we could cut back these hours, those are the companies that are going to be hit with fines and penalties from the IRS. But as long as you can show that, hey, before the Affordable Care Act became law, this is what we were doing beforehand, I think you'll be okay. The question that I would have to follow up with that is what's seasonal to you? Is it within those four months or is it longer? And how are you treating those employees? If you're bringing people on for seven, eight months in a seasonal basis, I doubt that's going to pass the mustard test. But I do know, for example, one of the that we gave in Washington, D.C. was Mount Hood. There's restaurants, resorts, um, coffee shops up there that are basically in business as long as there's snow. So what happens if the snow season extends a month or two? Well, that shouldn't be your responsibility as an employer. You didn't make it snow. So there's going to be some exceptions to that norm, but they are going to be looking for that employer that, you know, is this really a seasonal employee or not? Similarly, whether you're a W-2 or 1099 employee, did you have a bunch of W-2 employees, but you said, hey, forget this for 2013, 2014, I'm going to bump you back to 1099. But you're not changing the scope of their job. The IRS is going to say, wait a minute, that should be a W-2 employee. So I, good question, and, and thanks for bringing that up, because it's one of those that has a lot of moving pieces and parts to it. And, and to be honest, we won't really know, but how I'm coaching folks is it's going to be kind of one group, one, one employer at a time. Willis Middlemass, Gresham Insurance and Financial Services. 
I've been confused with this stuff for many, many years. Welcome uh, to the party. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a couple of things, I know there's not time to address all this stuff. There are a lot of individual plans out there. People are not employed someplace, they're self-employed, or they have a very small number of employees. Most of what we've addressed here doesn't affect those people. We have a lot of people on the medical insurance pool. The federal shut off their employment, or their enrollment, March 1st. Oregon is still open, because they gotta have something out there for yep. those people that can't qualify for underwriting. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the impact of this large pool that's gonna be eliminated What's that going to do to the world of? Can we lock the doors? Or can insurance. I keep you here till eight o'clock tonight? <laughs> so we talk about that it. Long. Anyway, um, any, any sure. input on that? I think sure. appreciate it. That's that, and you know, and that's a really good question because the one of the largest drivers we talked about it briefly in the presentation is the pre-existing condition clause for individual insurance uh, subscribers, and and as, as much as, as everybody seems to be hallelujah that we've needed that forever, this is the best thing about the Affordable Care Act. And it is. It's really good for a lot of people. Uh, now we're going to be able to offer you greater access to insurance premiums, but it's all going to come at a greater cost. And so what we have is we have the sole proprietor, the individual business owner who wasn't able to put together kind of a group plan to run it through taxes. And again, I'm, I'm not a CPA, nor do I ever want to be one. But the idea is what do we do for the, in, for the individuals in Oregon that will be forced to terminate their insurance come December 31st and re-enroll thanks to our friends at the exchange? If you current, let me say that again. If you currently are insured with an individual policy in the state of Oregon, that policy is going to be forced to terminate so that you will re-enroll because the exchange wants to know and, and, and now be given access to all those people. And what I mean by that is... What they're determining is that in their infinite wisdom, they think a lot of these folks that are going to be on these individual insurance products are, are low-income individuals. Um, and so basically, based off where you're at with the federal poverty level, which is around $11,400 in Oregon, Eleven thousand eleven thousand four ninety is one hundred percent poverty level here in Oregon. So if you're if you're at or above that, you qualify for a subsidy through the exchange, which means the lower you are on the federal poverty level, the more dollars the federal government is going to kick your way, so you pay less on your health insurance premiums. It's a good deal. It's a good deal if that's you. So so what so what do we do? So so there's there's that component. If you're an individual looking for insurance, you now have a, a great benefit where you might be able to get something at. 15, 20, 25 cents on the dollar for you and your family. If you're, if you're a unemployed or you're one of these 29ers whose employers doesn't offer insurance or you're a sole proprietor who's just starting out, you have, you're not declaring a lot of income yet, and you can qualify for a subsidized insurance plan through the exchange um, without pre-existing condition clauses coming into play. So what if you are the, um, let's shift gears for a minute, what if you're currently insured on the Oregon Medical Insurance Pool, OMIP. It's a high-risk pool. It's run by Regents Blue Cross Blue Shield. It's for those individuals in Oregon who applied for an individual policy and they were declined for whatever reason. Regents Blue Cross Blue Shield sponsors this plan. All of us are paying into it as insurance payers here in Oregon, and it affords the ability for somebody who, who needs who has a definite need for insurance to be able to afford a plan. And, and then I have to do this because the whole afford, because some of the rates are over eleven to $1,500 a month because Regents Blue Cross Blue Shield knows you're only here because you have to purchase a claim. So basically what's going to happen is those folks in that pool are just going to roll over to the exchange. And then it's going to be the whole income test. Do you qualify for a subsidy or not? If not, then take your pick. You qualify now for an individual insurance company through whatever carrier you want and go forth and prosper because no pre-existing condition clauses. Are the rates going to be less? Are they going to be more? I don't know, but there's going to be a lot of direction, a lot of education, a lot of networking, a lot of marketing for those folks. We have healthy kids campaigns for families with low-income children on kind of a similar subsidized program. How are we going to roll those folks over to the exchange? Are they going to stay healthy kids for a year or two? We don't exactly know. But there's a lot of federally and local state subsidized tax money at work making all this happen. Could we better spend that money elsewhere? Depends what side of the aisle you're on. And, and um, I'm kind of far away from the door at the moment, so I'll reserve my 
comment for when I'm out in the parking lot and I can get closer to my car. But um, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of kind of one-off silos involved. If you're currently insured, what else? What what do I do? If I'm currently insured in Oregon Medical Insurance Pool, what do I do? If I if I couldn't afford the high-risk pool but I need insurance, what do I do? Where do I go? And and our association, our National Association of Health Underwriters, based off of Washington D.C., we're starting to do some campaigns out to us brokers in the community where we can kind of start educating clients, educating those around us, and maybe we could run some things through the chamber on places to go, people to sit to, because it's it, it's going to change. And in 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 days of old, as of last year, you would come to me and we would sit, what kind of insurance do you want? And we talk about your health. We would talk about what, what doctors you go see, what hospitals do you go to? Do I think you're going to qualify for an insurance program or not? As of October, when these exchanges come up, we're going to flip the coin. I need to become a financial services expert because I need to start diving into your income, your family's income. What does your employer pay? Do you have a bunch of other assets, property, cars, um, um, retirement, and, and I need to figure out if you're going to qualify for a subsidy. So before I even get into how you doing, how's your health, what do you want there, we've got to spend, it's about, it's a 21-page application, I hope it stays at 21 pages, um, where the first half is it's finances. So we're changing the insurance game in Oregon where now it's, you know, is an exchange on the horizon for me? Is a high-risk pool on the environment for me? Do I have to go to my employer? But my wife gets an individual plan, and if I'm low income, can my child get healthy kids? There's all these moving pieces and parts that are going to come into play that are going to make it a lot more fun and exciting. But no, that's a, that's a, a good question with a long-winded answer, but there's going to be a lot, and there's a lot more that's going to come to it within the next couple months. I'm thinking maybe I should just retire. Yeah, <laughs> me too. Me too. Um, Tim, I'm Lila Leathers with Leathers Oil. And I was wondering on your health savings account, the $2,500 per year, does that, if you don't use all of it, will that run over to the next year? Can you keep it that way? No. You have to use no. it. You okay. have to use or lose it. You get a, in, in most cases, check with your contract. You might get a 90-day rollout. So if it's a January to December and you incurred a claim in October and you found the receipt in February, chances are, you, and if you had money left over from the previous year, you could file that $120 for a new set of glasses or whatever and, and get that back. But if you had a new claim in January, then the new claim would be on new January money going forward. Okay. The risk with that is because the IRS knows that we're all giving up FICA and FUTA money on that component, that there has to be some risk in the game. So the risk is could the employee, since it's a pledge, and they've said we're going to donate $200 a month to max out my benefit, in January, what if I decide to go get LASIK surgery and it costs me a thousand bucks? You'll pay that claim. <clears throat> You'll get me my thousand dollars, even though I've only paid in two hundred dollars. Hmm. Because there has to be some risk reward because the IRS says we can't just make this super easy. I need to tug a war a little bit between the employees and the employers. And then let's say compound the matter even more effectively. Let's say I quit. I send in my two hundred dollars. I get my eyes done, and in March, I quit. So I've only paid back three of that $900. You can't come after me. Wow. I'm done. Because what the IRS is thinking is that there's going to be enough money left over to cover you. That's their, that's their waiver because, hey, if we're giving up some income coming to us, the federal government, to allow people to kind of skirt that law a little bit, we can't make it super easy and fun and great for everybody. So that's kind of the that's kind of why there's a there's a there's a risk reward where we can't pay that money back to the employee, where now that stays kind of operational money what is ever left over for you stays you. So and and the idea is we educate the employees that your employers don't want that money. We want you to use it. You're, we're going to give you reports. We're going to give you ways on how to spend down that money where you'll get you'll get things either emailed or sent to you on. Here's a reminder: you've got two hundred eighty dollars left in your account. It's November fifteenth. We forecast you might have. $300 by the end of the year, here's some things you could do. Let's go use that money. So now they wouldn't get, I mean, we'd have to be, we would be responsible for whatever they owed if they left. How about at the end of the year, what happens to that money? It stays your money. It stays in? It stays Lila, stays Leathers, oil, okay. money. It stays in your operating account for okay. you to choose to do with how you see. You can't give back to your people. 
Okay. Next question. Um, as as an employee, do they also do we also have to provide uh, insurance for their family? Mm -mm. One of the things you're going to start reading about is, and, and you're going to seeing more, is this nebulous term called dependent. What does dependent mean? Right now, currently, in, in the, the, your current insurance plan that you offer your employees for 2013, dependent includes the spouse and any children that aren't, you don't currently employ on behalf of that employee. 2014, we're going to scratch the wife, the spouse, off of that equation. The spouse no longer becomes a dependent. So you no longer have to, as much as you, you know, I'm sure a lot of spouses are nice, mine is, but um, you, don't, you don't really have to be too concerned with what we're providing because the Affordable Care Act um, specifically states your employee, when it comes to affordability, the 9.5% of their box one gross wages on their W-2. Now, what box one includes, any CPAs in the room, correct me if I'm wrong, any deductions withheld for 401k or retirement plans. Any other money that might be held back for something along those lines, pension plan, uh, uh, a SEP, uh, if there's any uh, employee controlled stock, anything like that, that there might be a, as a qualified deduction. What that does is that buys down their taxable gross income. So right now what we're doing is we're going off that affordable complex as to what's 9.5% of the figure that's in that box if I'm worried about providing an insurance plan that is or is not affordable. Then the other component we have to kick in is the dependents. What about those kids? Because we have to make, for a large employer, over 50 lives, you have to make available dependent insurance coverage. So let me throw a wrinkle into your question, Lila. What if it's a low income employee, but you pass the 9.5% smell test because you're not asking them to pay more than 9.5% of their take-home pay for themselves. But they could go to the exchange and qualify for a subsidized plan for their kids because maybe the wife is a stay-at-home mom. So we don't have any income or part-timer or, or sells flowers or, or a barista at a coffee shop. I hear that a lot. But what happens is if you're a large employer and you make available affordable health insurance for either that employee and that employee's dependents, children, then those children cannot go to the exchange. So they will be, and, and again, depends on what, you know, published newspaper in Oregon you read. But it, 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 right now there's a lot of angst towards that because as much as the Affordable Care Act talks about I want to improve access of affordable insurance to all Americans, this component shoots that theory out the door because if you really want the affordable access to the insurance, allow your employees to buy a subsidized insurance plan through the exchange. So those are, those are some of the final regulations that are being depicted. But that's an area right now where there's a definite loophole. And when we're in Washington, D.C., talking to the IRS Department of Labor, they're looking at that. They just don't know how we can attack it because the Supreme Court said the law is the law. So can we go back and take out bits and bites of it and still the law be the law? I don't know. But that's, that's a very key component, and it's one that we're definitely watching because it impacts all of our clients. Now, if you're a small employer, there's some ways around it where if you're under 50 employees, you may be able to kick off the, ability, the, the idea of offering dependent insurance and just offer employee-only insurance. That's possibly on the table, too. So if you've got 12 employees and you really don't want it to be your deal, you might be able to, that we're looking into now, just offer an employee-only plan. Hi, Christy Brewster, Landmark Tax and Investment Services. Oh, great. Here we go. <laughs> no, I yeah. mean, she said health, um, health savings account, but... She meant flexible spending account. Yeah, yeah. I was going to clarify. Yeah. So the yeah. health savings account, they're not yep. going to change that on doing it. You could carry it forward and... Correct. Okay. Correct. I just to clarify the, the concern that. that we have about health care savings accounts is, are they going to pass the smell test? Because right now when we're talking about affordable health insurance, we as business owners, we talk about affordable health insurance as to what we pay for our employees to have insurance. With the IRS, what the White House deems as affordable is what does the employee pay when they incur a claim. They don't care what the cost of the insurance is. They care what the, what's the bill coming to the house of your employee if you have an HSA. And right now, 
HSAs, all first dollar coverage goes to the employee. There are no co-pays. You, you get the preventive stuff, like all the other plans do, for, for annual exams and that kind of stuff, which is great. But hospital visits, uh, urgent care, ER, prescription drugs, it's all first dollar. And in some of the calculation tests that we were doing to see if these HSAs would meet the bronze level, the, the essential health benefit, the staff in the sand that we've already decided here in Oregon, a lot of them don't. And we could be even looking at $2,600, $5,200 deductibles, standard deductibles that a lot of us in this, in this room have. But since there's no copay protection, everything is first dollar, they add that exposure to the HSA. And we're still trying to figure out where is that going to land for somebody who didn't qualify for a subsidy, was looking for an individual insurance policy, needed better tax benefits uh, to put greater money aside to offset their taxes. Where's that going to fall? And right now we don't know. So if you have an individual HSA, watch your mail. Stop and yeah, watch watch your mail because, like I said, all individual insurance plans in Oregon are going to be forced to term in December. Um, the insurance carriers have the ability to take a look at if they want to do it by December 31st or March 31st because everything by April 1st has to be rewritten so the, the, so the individual had, had the access or ability to re-enroll into the exchange. So we're not sure how HSAs are going to look when you're wanting to re-enroll into your individual plan come later this year. We don't know. So what I would suggest is watch your mail. And, and look at the insurance carrier that your policy is through, is like Pacific Source or Regents or something. Providence, get to know their website and get your member ID registered so you have your own kind of link to the carrier because they're going to start sending out information that way. So I'd get very familiar with that policy just to keep an eye. I'm, I'm not saying they're, they're going to go away, but they're being looked at that if you had a $1,500 or $1,600 deductible, it might be two or three or four times that in it, coming up next year. Miss Tina. Hello. Excellent job so far. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I have a question, and this is uh, kind of whether you've heard more current information, as no. Tim says. <laughs> um, the information that comes out of Cover Oregon and all the health insurance companies, it really changes every day. We hear on Monday that something's not going to be allowed, and by the end of the week it is. and always yep. has been, and everything's... So um, my question is about the exchange. And an, an individual can go to the exchange and if they qualify, receive a subsidy to help them pay for it. An employer can also go to the exchange, and if their you know, employees enroll through that, they can receive a tax credit uh, on the next year. Um, are they going to keep the law that's in effect right now that an employer cannot give an employee money to go buy money on the exchange? Right now, um, employers cannot give their employees money to buy an individual policy. And I've heard that there might be some wavering on that. Can you speak to that, please, Mr. Rash? No. Um, <laughs> again, I'm, I'm, I'm wedged in a corner here away from the door, so let me be careful. Um, I took an attorney out with me to meet with a restaurant client last week because I had these issues of um, exposure, things that employers are doing today to kind of skirt some of the loose issues that we currently have here in Oregon and some of the federal dollars on what you can do as an employer to offer insurance to your employees. And it and, and also came up with a startup company that was hiring some of these young, vibrant, fresh out of college, some on their parents' plan, some had their own individual insurance plan because they were young, start, younger families kind of a deal. And the group rates that we were running through the carrier with their census were not beating the individual rate. So the, so the owner of the company asked me and says, well, so basically if I want to offer a group insurance plan to these employees, we're going to have to pay twice what they're currently paying. And I said, yes. Yeah. Because you can't waive off on a small employer plan for your employees that have individual coverage. If they're on the census, if they work greater than your, your hours, if they work for you longer than your probationary period, they have to be on your group plan unless they can waive off to a spouse's group coverage. Individual insurance doesn't matter. So we had a real fun, exciting conversation, basically stating that you should keep what you have and continue to hire people in this demographic, if it works for you, that currently have individual insurance, because for about the next six, seven months, it's going to work great. 
and then call me in the fall, and we'll rerun these rates when they get the renewal notice that their individual policies are jumping, and then they might come close to what the group plan would be. Because we are. You're, you're, the consumerism for the younger, healthy, possibly wealthier Oregonian, that window is starting to close. So why not take advantage of it as long as you can? But there are going to be the issue on the employer that says the health insurance I was offering my people was a, was a $300 bonus each month because I didn't want to have a group insurance policy. I didn't want to go through this mess. And I said, you're on your own, and here you go. I'm going to pay you $300. For that employer that's, a, that's small, that's kind of in the 10 to 15 range, I think the exchange is going to be a great place for you because you can basically state, I'm going to continue paying you $300 go forth and prosper, we're going to bring in an insurance broker, they're going to educate you on the exchange, choose what you want. If there's eight people in the room, you could have eight different insurance carriers, eight different plans, have a good time, I'm going to pay you 300 and then let me know what you purchased so I can withhold from your paycheck the balance if you went over. And it's going to be a beautiful thing. It really will work out well. Um, we will have to remember that, you know, Johnny and Steve have different insurance carriers, have different plans, so the one shoe that fits all feet that we normally used to go in with these small employers, that option's off the table, but the Affordable Care Act talks about access, and it talks about is this a way, is this a way for people to kind of choose the benefit that they want for their needs, and I think it's going to be a good fit. It, I think the first probably 18 months is going to be a nightmare as to what did I buy, what am I paying, I thought I had this, but I have that kind of stuff. But I really think it's going to be a good option for those, those that want it or the, and those employers that are operating under that mantle. The surprise <clears throat> is going to be to the owner because the owner is going to be wealthy enough that they're not going to qualify for a plan. And so we may be taking this group that had 12 people that was mostly younger employees offset with that average demographic giving you a good rate. We take off the young people, we leave the older people behind, and your rates could triple. Because the Affordable Care Act is, is affording the insurance carriers less of ability for a parity between the young and the old. That's now shrinking. So where it used to be you couldn't have it greater than, than 5 to 1, say I couldn't have something, you know, 200, 200 bucks and $800, now we're shrinking that. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to penalize the younger folks because we know that pre-Medicare age employee, we can't penalize them any more than we already are. So basically that's going to drive up the cost of our younger, invincible individual who had that individual plan where my employer was paying me 300 bucks and my plan was 120. That's going to flip. So um, there's going to be a lot of those situations available. I think we're going to see a lot more as to what's the best option for me, my employees, my employer. But um, no, Tina, that was a good question because, yeah, we don't, we don't exactly know how, nor have we received the final regs on how to handle that. We'll know probably New Year's Eve. Yeah. yeah. So. One more quick. Lori Stegman, Stegman Insurance Agency. So on that same thought, couldn't the owner just purchase an individual policy? Right, and that's, and that's what we're doing because now you, the, the owner is going to go from that tax deductible qualified business expense to an individual policy. So it's a discussion with their CPA on how's this going to impact my business? How's this going to help me? And are they still going to want to write a company check for their individual policy, which you can't do? So there's going to be some change. There's going to be some definite shifts for that group, for that kind of employer on this isn't just about trying to find the cheapest insurance plan we can find. We're going to have to evaluate all the other pieces and parts, dependents, um, CPA, tax qualified. Are you, is, is the shop, the small employer health options in the exchange a good option, or should we just keep doing what we're doing, keep the group plan in place for another year? So, yeah, there'll be a lot more things to evaluate this year, and I can't wait. Tim, thank you very much for joining You're us welcome. today. You're welcome. Thanks, thanks for letting me be here. Tim is literally a walking encyclopedia on healthcare reform, and so I'm sure he'll stick around. You can talk to him offline. I uh, just wanted to let you know, please take uh, about 20 seconds to fill out the uh, evaluation form. Um, let us know what is on your mind and helps us out with some issues and topics that we'd like to address in the future. Now, we have another special uh, program this Thursday. So. 48 hours from now, we will have Congressman Earl Blumenauer with us, and we are going to 
uh, have a joint session with the um, East, East Metro Economic Alliance for a town hall. This will be at 1130 at the East Hill Youth Center, uh, down in their youth, um, youth center uh, chapel. And so we'll be uh, meeting there. Again, uh, it'll be a lunch arrangement uh, as well, just our regular uh, uh, lunch time, but just at a different location, East Hill Youth Center. Then next month, Tuesday, June 25, we'll have the East County Mayor's Forum with Shane Bemis, Doug Doust, uh, Patricia Smith and Mike, Mother Mike Weatherby, uh, the four mayors of our region, will be joining us uh, for their annual uh, uh, East County Mayor's Forum. And also, I'd like to uh, let you also know, oh, on, uh, in July, we'll then have our post-legislative session wrap-up with our East County legislators, so look forward to them joining us in July. Thank you very much for joining us. And, oh, yes, just... Remind you, uh, you are free to take your Riverview mug, uh, compliments of Riverview Community Bank and Casey Ryan, uh, sponsors of Government Affairs Forums. So thank you very much, Riverview. Feel free to take the mug. Thanks for joining us today, and we'll see you next month. We'll see you on Thursday.